If you'll look with me to the scriptures, we'll be reading from Ephesians. This is on page 1389 in the Pew Bible. And let me say, if you don't have a Bible of your own, we would love to get one to you. Uh, so if you'd see me or one of the elders uh, after the service, we'll, uh, we'd love to, to get you a Bible. Um, but uh, for now, if you'll turn uh, with your pew Bible, 1389, I'll be reading uh, from uh, the 11th verse uh, to the end of the chapter. You'll also find um, an insert uh, with the notes uh, of what we'll be looking at together. Hear now God's holy, inerrant word. Actually, starting at the very tail end of verse 10. In him, that is Christ, we also have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, Having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance, with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, to the praise of his glory. For this reason, I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you, and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you, while making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of all... Our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, so that you may know what it is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might which he brought about in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and gave him his head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord God, we thank you for this, your word that you've given to us. We ask that you would now work in and through it in me as a, a very broken vessel, but one capable by your strength to declare your word for your people. So we ask that you would not only convict us of sin, but restore us and encourage us, encourage us with the truth of your word that we might go from here praising your name and extending your grace to all those that you bring into our path. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our family had a delightful time yesterday. One, just what a New England day. I mean, that was a Chamber of Commerce kind of gorgeous Saturday, right? And uh, we had the incredible privilege of, of being invited to... Uh, Annabelle's home and vineyard. Do you all know that Annabelle has a vineyard? It was a wondrous uh, day to be out amongst the, the vines and to be uh, helping. You know, we, we we're trying to help Annabelle. We, we, uh, mostly we're learning uh, from her and her family as they were harvesting the grapes and, and bringing those in to, to get them and sort them and press them and, and uh, make delicious juice and, and wine. And, and it was just a, a wonderful day of, of being there with Annabelle and her family. But the thing that, that stuck me, struck me as I was learning, I, I'm, I'm a suburban kid. I, I, you know, I know about uh, grapes based on you know, what's for sale at Hannaford, right? And so I, I, I don't, I, you know, they got two different kinds of grapes there and the vines and they're, they're pulling off the netting and they're, they're getting, you know, trying to make sure that all this is, is done well. Um, but that, that's all new to me. And, and yet, thinking about and meditating upon this, this passage and the way in which God, we've, we're seeing in Ephesians, has adopted us into his family. And it's easy for us to focus on the, the precious moments kind of Hallmark Channel highlights of, of that, right? Of the, the, 
picture of the baby just being adopted. And, oh, isn't that so cute? That, right? And, and forget about the messiness of all the stuff that goes into adopting children into your family, right? It's not just the, the, the picture postcard moments. It's all of the stuff in between. And that, that ideally we, what we are hoping to see is not just this baby always being a baby, but growing into maturity in the same way that, that in those vines, they, they got these clippings from, from other vineyards. And, and it would have been very odd if we'd gone over to see Annabelle's vineyard and she took us to her, her kitchen and showed us all the little jars of water with little clippings in them. I said, oh yeah, this is, this is my vineyard. We got this from, from some great vineyards uh, out, out in, in uh, Minnesota. And, and look at all these different kinds of vines and grapes. I would have looked at her and said, um, gosh, I don't mean to be indelicate or anything, but uh, those are clippings, right? No, she took us out to out in the yard where where there were vines growing and there were tons of things that they had done with those vines over years to get them to the point where they were growing up and over the arbors and had huge clusters of grapes that you could harvest and pick and bring in and enjoy. Well, sometimes we approach our adoption in Christ like God just has you know these clippings. There it is, his kitchen windowsill. And we're we're brought into the family of Christ, and and we just stay right there in our little thing of water. Testaments to Jesus' grace, he saved us. Isn't that great? But what we find here in Ephesians, rather, is, is that he he reminds us not only that God is the one who's completely at work in bringing us into his family but that he's brought us into his family for a purpose. And that purpose ultimately is for him to receive the glory in and through our adoption and our maturing in Christ. Now again, that seems very odd to us because again, if it, we, we learn about things of God in how he works in and around us and we, we've got so many different models and images of, of those things and so if we if we went to a family that was adopting children and they said, oh yes, look, we've, we've adopted all of these children, aren't we great? We'd kind of say, um, isn't this more about the kids? You know, I'm kind of thinking. And, and so we, we apply that to God as well. And you see, it would be odd and disturbing for adoptive parents to have it all be about them. In fact, adoption agencies do a lot of questioning of why folks want to adopt and if it's all about them they're not so excited about them being ad adoptive parents but that's because we are finite and we're broken and so if anything is all about me or all about us we have a word for that narcissistic right you see, that's, that's not okay because there's nobody on the planet that is all that, where it ought to be all around them. In fact, that's one of the things that we find in maturing, in growing up, is that passing from childhood where we think the world revolves around us to coming to the very harsh reality that the world isn't all about us. And that's part of our, our maturing. But you see, the reality is, is that God is all of that. He really is the one who's worthy of all glory and all praise and all honor. And so it makes sense that his adoption of us isn't just about us. It's about him. And so we'll see in this particular passage these three things that you see in your notes here. First, we're adopted to bring God glory. That's the purpose for his adopting us. Second, we are to mature together in Christ. That is, we're not to stay as babes in Christ, but to grow and mature in him. And third, we'll see how God's power is at work in our growth. That, that he's the one supplying the power for us to grow and mature 
together in Christ. So the first thing, we're adopted to bring God glory. We see this particularly in these first verses, 11 to, to 14, where we see the purpose of our adoption. We see it uh, here in, in 12 explicitly and then uh, uh, repeated again in 14. He's talking about these two groups, and we've seen this before in, in this passage, that there were those who were the Israelites, right, the Jews, who had been looking forward to the Messiah, and that's the first group he talks about here, uh, that he says, um, uh, to the end that we who are first to hope in Christ would be the praise of his glory. That is, the, the Jews coming to faith were, were adopted into God's family so that God would be praised as a result of his grace to those who didn't deserve that grace. But that's not just true of the Jews, it's also true of the Gentiles, as he goes on to say, and in him you also, after hearing this message, right, you were granted faith and brought in, why? To the praise of his glory. That the telos, the, the end purpose of our being adopted into God's family is as trophies of God's grace. That, that we would not be those who, who are brought into the family and say, yeah, you know, we're, we, we got it all together. We, we know our, our Bible and we know our theology and, and we're, we're witnessing and we're doing all kinds of missions and we're part of a church that does all this great stuff. No, it's not about all of those things for our glory. Rather, we're adopted and brought in because we don't deserve any of those things. But God, by his grace, lavishes his blessings on us so that we then might extend that grace to others and be a testimony of God's grace. That, that when we gather and say, God saved somebody like me, we can look at one another and go, yeah, me too. That, that this is not a congregation where we go, oh, well, we're the congregation in Woodstock. I mean, we're, you know, we're the right kind of people. No, but we would be those who would gather and, and recognize God saved even us? What a remarkable God this is. That he would save us out of our self-righteousness, out of our wickedness, out of our sin and brokenness. We are testimonies of God's amazing grace. And it's a grace that he gives us in order that we might grow in that grace. That 5, 10, 50 years from now, we would give testimony all the more of God's work in us. Not only did he save us, but he allowed us the privilege to participate in his work. I know a lot of times... For us, particularly as Bible-believing Christians who understand that we're supposed to be sharing our faith, that we're supposed to be evangelizing our, our neighbors and our co-workers and our friends, we can be very navel-gazing in the way that we think about that. I've, I've, not, I've not really seen anybody come to faith. and I, I don't know if something's wrong with me. I, and, and all of those things tend to be about us. Where what we find in the Scripture is not that at all, but rather... Hey, can I tell you about what God did with me? I mean, you wouldn't believe it. If I sat down with you and talked to you about all that he's done, you wouldn't believe it. But it's true. And he can do the same for you. See, this is what it means to be adopted into his family. To, to understand our purpose is to give him glory and that that glory is magnified, it increases as we grow and mature in our faith, as we understand the gospel more, and therefore live it out more and more in everyday life. We're adopted, so you might say, in order to bring God glory, and we're adopted in order to grow in our maturity. That the scripture talks about us being co-heirs together with Christ, and that more and more us resembling Christ brings God more glory. Why? Because he's the one who did that. See, so often we're surrounded by, at every turn, things of accomplishment having to do with us. 
or even if we're if we're cognizant of the fact that graduation, right? I, I got here, I graduated, I, I did the hard work, I put in all the labor, and I and I graduated with this degree, but I recognize I still thank my parents, I thank the, the friends, the teachers, the you know, that there's there are a lot more other folks that were involved in it wasn't just my efforts in that. But all the more so, what Christ has done for us in salvation is I didn't deserve any of these things. And yet, he has drawn me into his family. And that he adopts us not to be forever babes in Christ, but to grow up in him. That we might give testimony in all of our thoughts and words and actions that he, by his grace, had made, has made us sons and daughters of the king. The second thing that we see in this passage, primarily in those verses 15 to 19, is that we are to mature together in Christ. That, that this growth, that this maturing process is something that we're to do together. We find that in, in how Paul even starts this in talking about it, in talking about praying for them. And here is where we need to learn from our southern brothers and sisters. They, they have this word here that Paul uses. You may not have realized that Paul is Southern. But he says he's praying for y'all. Right? See, we, when we Northerners say you, you don't know whether we mean you or you, 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 you. Right? And, and so it's important here that he uses this word y'all because that's how it works. That's the intent. Right? Now again, we know this relationally in, in, in families. When, when Kristen and I see our children not just doing things for themselves, but doing things together and helping one another. Right? It's, it's beautiful. Now, we're broken, so it only happens very rarely. But when it does, it's beautiful. And not to knock on my kids, it's the same with my brother and me, right? You know, And probably true with you too. But, but Paul prays for them collectively. He prays for y'all. He prays for them together. He says, I'm praying for you. Now notice, as he does this, he links these two things that we're going to see again and again throughout this book and throughout all of Scripture. As he prays for them, he prays for them saying, for, since, um, I, uh, for this reason I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, which exists among you, and your love for all the saints. Right? So Paul rejoices, not just because he's heard they've believed. Right? They walked the aisle, they, they prayed the prayer, they, they believed. But he also links that with what? Their actions. Since I've heard that you've believed, and your love for the saints. Right? That, that those two things are meant to go together. That Paul's prayer for them, his rejoicing, the reason why he's so stoked and, and giving Jesus a high five in prayer is because he sees faith being exhibited both through what is said and through what is done. And so he rejoices. That that's part of this growth process is, is that we learn to rejoice not only for ourselves and what God's done in our salvation, but that we rejoice over what God has done in our brothers and sisters' salvation. And yet so often in the church what we do is we say, thank you, Jesus, that, that you saved me. And well, thank you for this brother or sister that you've brought here. Please, Lord. Do a work in them. Right? We celebrate what he's done in us, and yet we're not so sure about what he's done in one another. And yet this is not what we find in the scripture. He thanks God for them. He rejoices together. And that prayer in and of itself is a work of maturity. That it's a means by which we grow in Christ and are made more mature. And I think it's instructive that Paul, in talking about the, the folks here in uh, Ephesus, people with whom he has spent years, he knows these people perhaps better than any of the other congregations to whom he wrote. And he, he doesn't start out by saying, okay, 
Beloved believers, I've done this for you. I've done, I'm, I'm working on this. I'm, I'm really hammering away at this other thing. What he starts with is prayer for them. Giving thanks and rejoicing. It, it matches with what we saw in the beginning of this chapter, is that he starts with a song of praise. That, that he's caught up in dance and song because of the wonder of what he sees that God has done in their midst. And so the overflow of that joy is prayer for the, the people in Ephesus. I know oftentimes when, when we hear of someone in need, and, and we, you know, particularly us guys, we like to fix stuff, right? And so we hear of somebody in need and we're, we're scrambling thinking, okay, what can I do to help? What can I do to fix? Right? And, and the ladies too, you come along, well, I, I want to do something. I don't want to just, you know, hear of this need and not do anything. And so oftentimes we'll say, uh, well, I'll, I'll pray for you. But in our heart and in our thinking, often we're, we're like, well, you know, that's really not much, right? But that's not what we find in the scripture. And again, as we're going to see what our growth is linked to the, the power of God himself, is, is that our prayer for other people is actually the most powerful thing that we could do for them. Right? Put it this way. So if, if I hear you've had something go wrong with your house, Right? You're a friend of mine in the, in the Carolinas, and like my friend Andy, who's, you know, the, the winds came and blew off the top of, of their house. The roof just, you know, peeled back and all the rain came in, you know. And so I might say, okay, Andy, um, you know, I'm kind of tied up. I'm, I'm new at this church up in, in Vermont, so I can't really take much time, but, it, you know, um, you know I'll, I'll send you some things to, to help you, in, in, you know, in, in the mail. And I might think, well, that, you know. But... I've got the God of the universe who, who bids me come into my presence and ask me for all the things that you need. And I'll not only hear you, but I'll listen to you and I'll work through what you request. You know, I might have some connections with a few contractors in the Carolinas and I might say, hey, I can't get down there, but, but hey, Bob, can you go over and, and help Andy? Now that, that might be a really practical good thing that I could do to help Andy. But, but my connections with a contractor pale in comparison to my being connected to the king of kings. Who knows every contractor on the planet? Right? So praying for someone is not less than, and gosh, I really wish I could do something substantial. As if prayer isn't substantial. In fact, what we find is, is that prayer is the lead thing here in terms of growth and maturing in Christ. That when we pray for folks, it demonstrates that we really care about them. Now this time of year, there are lots of our friends who are going back to school. And one of the things that if you haven't had this experience of going away to college is, is that a lot of our friends who have gone off to college for the first time are having a really hard time. Right? And it's particularly hard because they've heard all these great stories of, of friends who've gone off to college and, and met fantastic roommates and they're best buds and they're, you know, they do everything together. And they get to college and it's like their roommate's like, yeah, hey, you kind of look funny and uh, I don't really want to spend any time with you. Don't touch my stuff. And they leave, right? And, and so, you know, as we have friends that are struggling with those things, I think, Lord, I, I want to do something. He says, yeah, dummy, pray. <laughs> Talk to me about that. Ask me for the things that you can't do, but that I can. And Paul understood this, and so he's praying for his brothers and sisters in Christ in Ephesus. That God might work in them, that he might mature them, that he might grow them in all of these ways that God's glory might be made more clear, might be made more known. We're in Christ together, and so our faithfulness is in Him. It's not in what we do. We're to grow and become more faithful, more in line with Christ, but our doing that doesn't accomplish it. We're in Him. So this might help. 
in talking about righteousness, right? If we're to grow and mature, we're to become more Christ-like, the scripture talks about that as being righteous. And Martin Luther rightly understood what the scripture teaches on this and talked about an alien righteousness, right? That, that the righteousness that we have in Christ is alien, that is, it, it doesn't come from us. It's not our righteousness, it's Christ's righteousness that he gives to us. But you see, the scripture never says, okay, you're to have this alien righteousness and that's all. But what this passage is getting at is, is that that alien righteousness, the only righteousness that we have is from Christ, we are to grow in more and more having that alien righteousness become resident righteousness, become us living out and doing these things that Christ would have in us. That is, we're conformed into his image that that would show up and be demonstrated by us doing the right things for the right reasons. Now it's clear from scripture that we will never get there fully until Christ comes again and glorifies us. But that, that alien righteousness is not an excuse for us to go, well, you know, I've got the alien righteousness of Jesus, I'm all good. So I can go and do as much unrighteousness as I want. Scripture's clear, may it never be. Now, understanding that you've been given this alien righteousness ought to then encourage us, embolden us, empower us to live out that righteousness of Christ. And this is what it means for us to grow as part of the body of Christ. Now, this, this growth in him is organic, but it's also certain. And so sometimes there's a lot of confusion on this. I, I remember one uh, youth pastor who was discipling us and, and hammering on the alien righteousness piece, hammering on the, the good and right things of, of Scripture, that we gain everything through Christ, and it's not our own doing. So the, the parables of, of Jesus talking about, I am the vine and you are the branches. Right? That, that everything that you get is through me. And that is absolutely true. But sometimes we think about that in terms of like the, the vineyard at, at Annabelle's place. Like you go out into the middle of the vineyard and, and you see the vine coming up and then you see the, the grapes there and you listen real carefully. You don't hear the grapes going, right? Like they're, they're straining to grow, right? And so sometimes we take that and say, okay, so, so you shouldn't strain to grow. No, you should understand that all that I have is from Christ. But that if, if we weren't to do anything else to grow, Paul wouldn't say, hey, I'm praying for you that you would grow. Well, you're, you're already growing. It's going to just happen. It's, it's, it's a done deal. I, I don't have to worry. No, God uses means. He uses us. Yes, to accomplish what he has ordained and what he will accomplish and that he will get all the glory for. But in the meantime, he uses us to pray for one another. He uses us to do the very hard work of reading and studying his word, of working out our salvation in fear and trembling, of, of trying to understand and put these things into practice. That we're to grow as a living organism. That, that we understand that that growth takes pruning and fertilizing and, and all of these things that, that are good. So you go out into the, the vineyard and you know you don't hear the vines grunting. But you very likely will see Annabelle's family pruning and clipping, fertilizing, testing and growing and helping in all of these things. And so that's what Paul is doing and what he calls us to do in one another's lives as well. So first of all, we're adopted into God's family to bring God glory. Second, we're to mature together in Christ. We're supposed to be growing and maturing together in him. And third, we find that God's power is what's at work in our growth. Notice what is the, the substance of what Paul prays. He prays specifically for them. In verse 18, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power towards us who believe. These three things that he prays for in particular, right? What are they? He, he prays for hope, 
riches, and great power. What he's praying for are the very things that we already know in the gospel to be at work in us. This hope of his calling, what is that? That, that God has called us into his family, that he's adopted us for this purpose. And that in that, he already talks about our inheritance because he is going to do it. It's not as if he calls us and says, well, you know, okay, maybe you'll make it, maybe not. You're on the JV squad now, we'll see how you go. No, he calls us into his family and seals us with his spirit. And he says, okay, now let's, let's get involved in the family business. And it's not by your power, but by mine. And so Paul's prayer for them is not, okay, we really need them to develop these gifts and do all these things so that we don't get behind. No, he prays for the actual things of the gospel, that they would, they would know those things, that they would be certain of those things. He prays for them to have this hope that, that we might know with certainty what God has called us to. And that hope is what leads us even when the, when the task is difficult. And not only that we'd have this hope, but we would also have the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. That, that God has this stockpile of riches that are for his children. And we spend so much of our time eke, trying to eke out a, a little bit of this or, or that. He says, go to the Lord of the harvest. If you have need, go to him. Ask him. And so he says, I'm praying that the Lord might reveal to you this hope of your calling and the riches that he has so that we could stop trying to, to earn it on our own but recognize that God has already paid for it. And then third, that we would understand the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. Again, I... I don't know anything that drives me to, our knee, to my knees more than being a dad. Because I'm completely and absolutely, utterly unable to do for my children what I want. Because I want them to grow and mature and be godly young men and women. And I can show them, I can model, I can teach them, but I can't do it. And so what does that get me to do? drive to my knees, fall to my knees, and pray for God to do what only he can do. But then here's the mystery, is, is that he uses our prayers in accomplishing what only he can do. So oftentimes we, we put up God's sovereignty and our responsibility as if they're, they're in conflict with one another. But what we find in the gospel is, no, he's completely sovereign. And by his grace, he uses us to accomplish what he's sovereignly decreed. And we see that not in some abstract theological construct. We see that in the very practical thing of them growing and maturing in Christ as part of God's family. So he says all of these things, the hope, the riches, the surpassing greatness of his power, are in accordance with the working of his power. And then he runs to the resurrection. He says not only did Jesus do all of these things, but God has raised him from the dead to demonstrate that he has authority, that he has power over everything. And so when we wrestle with our besetting sins, when we wrestle with the ways in which we're half-hearted in trying to follow Jesus, when we wrestle with even having a desire to see our neighbor come to Christ, we can run to him and say, you're the God of the resurrection. You can take what was dead and make it alive. Do that in me. Do that in us. We want to be alive in you. We want to be active. We want to, to experience your power in what we're doing as we do what you've called us to do. These hope, riches, and power are in accordance with the working of his resurrection power. Our knowing what is true is what applies the power of the resurrection in our lives. The re there's a reason why God's people read and study and meditate and memorize this book. It's because knowing the truth of what Christ has done is the source of our power. It's what sets us free from the, the bondage that sin and death continue to try to put back on us. It's the only hope for our neighbors and co-workers and friends. And so we need to keep coming to him to recognize this ascended kingdom power that Christ has in us. And so what do we do with that? 
How, how are we praying for one another? Do you pray for one another like, um, okay, Lord, it's my quiet time. I'm kind of busy. I, I, I've only got eight minutes, not ten today. And so here's my prayer list. Yes, Jesus, help these people uh, and, and read a passage and then, and then go. Let me ask you, how, how did you pray when you were absolutely up a creek without any hope at all? Maybe it was in school. Maybe it was in a relationship. Maybe it was, it was something that you found yourself in utter chaos in. My favorite was when my brother, who just had his uh, driver's permit, not his license yet, just his driver's permit, had taken the family car a little too fast around a corner with gravel and flipped it on top of its hood and, and skidded down the road. And so he called mom and said, can you come bring a rope? Right? How, how do you pray when you're in the ditch and you have no cell service and you, you are just out of luck? How do you pray? Okay, I've, I've got about eight minutes. Let's, let's, no. Oh, Lord! Do you realize you're in a ditch? Do you realize that the God of the universe has, has brought you into this place that you might cry out to him and see him at work through the power of the resurrection? Let's pray like that and encourage one another. Pray for one another in that way that his name might be glorified here in Woodstock and throughout Vermont and the world. Amen. Lord, thank you for your goodness and grace to us. We confess we don't, we don't know how to pray the way that we're supposed to. We don't know how to grow the way we're supposed to. But you've, you've promised us that you will not leave us or forsake us, that you will teach us and show us, that you've given us your spirit. And so we ask, Lord, that you would move in us, that you would help these words to, to connect with our hearts and our minds, that you... Heavenly Father, would continue the work that you've begun in us so that we might be like our elder brother, Jesus, and so give you glory and honor. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.